Hey, Peter. Hey. You know, today we're listening to an album by Donny Hathaway and Roberta Flack. Oh, I can't I wait. One of I my love favorites. this album. You know what it's called, though? Yeah, Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway. That makes sense. Yep. I'm Adam Menes. And I'm Peter Martin. And you're listening to the You'll Hear It podcast. Music Explored. Explored today, we're exploring one of the greats, one of the all-time great records. Doesn't get any better than this. It doesn't get any better. And you know what, Peter? This is uh, an album, Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway. It's from 1972. Yeah. 1972, one of the greatest years in music history. Oh, so much. It's kind of like a 1959. Uh, It's an incredible year for music history. And this album... Wait, which Taylor Swift album was released in 72? I believe it was 1989 was released in 1972, (laughs) ironically. Prethemously. Yeah, uh, yeah. (laughs) Premathly. 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 No, but this... Oh, do you want me to tell... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but... (laughs) Let's do that early. Um, you want me to tell you about 1972? Because I don't think you know about 1972, and I do. I was literally <laughs> not on the planet. I was a, I was I was in diapers. Uh, okay. I'm not gonna lie, so but I was ex- I was exploring the world in '72. It was a great time. Yeah, I was not alive. Right. So, but great time for music, for war and uh, politics and stuff. Not great. <laughs> not great. <laughs> yeah. But for music, great. So here's what was going on. Here in 1972. This was released in April 1972, although the singles for this were kind of happening for like a year before. Yeah. The cultural context of the Roberta Flack, Donny Hathaway album, uh, the president was good old uh, Dick Nixon. He was on his way out, though. Richard, His days were numbered. <laughs> Richard Milhouse. He had a, he had a yeah. He right. was, was going to be doing this yeah. pretty soon, which uh, is for heavy metal, right? <laughs> some things going on in sports, Peter. The MLB had its first ever strike that stopped baseball. Wow. In this month. Wow. Uh, the United States and the USSR and 70 other nations agreed to ban biological weapons at the Biological Weapons Convention. Sounds like a fun convention. <laughs> is that like Roundup? They banned Roundup. <laughs> they certainly didn't ban that. Uh, the number one movie in the Mar- in America was The Godfather. Man, that that's, that's pretty one of the good. greatest movies ever. The number one TV show was All in the Family. So I do remember some pretty around, good pop culture going on right now. I remember watch like my parents watching that probably a few years after this, but I remember kind of like seeing that that was one of the early sitcoms. Norman Lear, shout out. Now the number one pop song of 1972. <laughs> yes is a big part of the album we're listening to today. It wasn't on the album, but it's no. one of the reasons why this album was made. It's one of the reasons why this album was such a hit. Yeah. The number one pop song in 72 was The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face from Roberta Flack. That's from her 1969, I believe, album. Yes. Yeah. For some reason, it came First alive. Take. First take. First take, yeah. yeah. And it came alive in 72 after it was featured in a Clint Eastwood film. Yes. Uh, and it was a huge hit for yeah. Roberta Flack. And so her record label... Atlantic. Uh, Atlantic Records put her, decided to put her together with another uh, young singer songwriter who actually Roberta Flack had recorded some of his songs and worked with before yes. Donny Hathaway. And they made this duo record, which we're going to talk about a little bit, Peter, the duo records and why they were so amazing at this time yeah. and even a little after. And they've just kind of fell off as far as like true, like equal duo. We'll talk about that when we get to the rants. But uh, so that's kind of the cultural landscape, right? Yes. You got The Godfather, you got All in the Family, the great Norman Lear, great Carol O'Connor. Yep. And you got the first time ever I saw your face, Roberta Flack taken off. Um, and so that's when this album drops. Yes, absolutely. And so Donnie was actually a little bit younger than Roberta at this time. He was 27 when they uh, released this record. Roberta Flack was 35. Um, and they they both went to Howard University, but I don't believe they knew each other. They weren't there at the same time. But they have a lot of, um, you know, musical and cultural connections before they even met. You can hear it in the music. Um, we're going to talk about the intersection of classical, gospel, and jazz, piano playing in particular, of course, mm-hmm. vocals. Um, both Roberta and Donnie were incredible keyboardists, pianists, organists electric pianist, but also incredible vocalist and songwriter. So it was a lot of talent coming together um, to be harnessed. And for Donnie, this was actually his third record on Atlantic. Um, his next record after this, in, in I mean, this was back in the time when like you're coming out with an album every year, you know. Um, but Extensions of a Man came next in 73. And that's a very, that's, you know, might be an apex mountain for him kind of personally and musically, but he had a lot of great stuff. He's just coming off of, the the uh, Donny Hathaway Live, which was at the Bitter End in New York and the Troubadour in L.A. 
Um, so a lot of buzz about him. But, you know, Stevie Wonder talking book came out in 72. So like there was, it wasn't like Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway was the only thing in this R&B genre uh, that folks were listening to of this creative music, Black American music genre. Was talking about 72 or 71? I think it came out in 72. Yeah. So here's here's all of, I've got a list here of, of some of the Ooh. biggest albums in 1972. Yes. How about this for a list, yeah. right? Exile on Main Street, The Rolling Stones. Mm. Harvest, Neil Young. Pink Moon, Nick Drake. The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust. Nick Drake from Canada? From England. Okay. The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust from, from David Bowie. Uh, Young, Gifted, and Black, Aretha Franklin. Let's yeah. Stay Together, Al Green. Mm. Talking Book, Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Uh, Fox Chot, Trot, Genesis. That's a, a underrated album there. Paul Simon's first solo album, Paul Simon. For the Roses, Joni Mitchell. Uh, Superfly, Curtis Mayfield. Damn. Roxy Music, Roxy Music, Music of My Mind, Stevie Wonder, On the Corner, Miles Davis, uh, Chicago <laughs> record. Five. Mm. Uh, we got, uh, what else here? It looks good. I Dr. Believe... John's Gumbo came out oh, here. Oh, that's a great record. And St. Dominic's Preview from Van Morrison. I mean, this is like, oh, The Grand Wazoo from Frank Zappa. This is an incredible, incredible year for music. Something, anything from Todd Rundgren. Also an incredible album. Can't Buy a Thrill, Steely Dan, Damn. Transformer from Lou Reed. I mean, this is like, this is some 72. classics. 72, shout out 72. Dude, I've, we, I think I did a whole show once with our mutual friend, Brian Owens, where we just did music from 1972. And yeah. it was like banger after banger after banger. Wait, did you say Tapestry? Was no. That 72? It, that was right around here. Uh, no, I think Maybe that was 71. 74, I think. Oh, 74, yeah, okay. I think so, or 75. But that's, I mean, so we're going to talk about Carol King because she, she, of course, had a big imprint on this album we're listening to today and with her own version of... Uh, as well as, as well as James Taylor. I mean, all these came out right around that same time. Uh, the version of um, You've Got a Friend. But you mentioned Curtis Mayfield, so there's a connection there with Donny Hathaway. That's kind of how he got his start when he was up in Chicago. Um, Donny Hathaway, of course, St. Louis's own Vashon High School graduate from from but a mile from where we sit now, and uh, but had a big Chicago connection. I believe he was born in Chicago. And um, and also passed away tragically early. Yes. Donnie yeah. Hathaway, like yeah. his career in life cut tragically short. And, One of the huge, big tragedies of, I think it was in 78 or 79, yeah. um, was was cut short. I mean, he was, I believe he was like right around 40. Mm. Or no, or I don't think he was 40. Yeah, I don't think he was 40. I don't yeah. think he was 40. Yeah. But just a massive force in the music and a, a child prodigy. Yeah. Um, you know, like kind of, I mean, from really little in terms of playing and singing, came up singing in the church um, and, and you know, classical player, some jazz, obviously blues, gospel, uh, kind of a lot of different influences and skills that he developed. So by this time, I mean, he was like only 27, but he had a lot to say. He'd already written a lot of music for others. He had his own band, blah, 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 blah. Um, and uh, yeah. I mean, I think Roberta Flack too, like like we mentioned, First Take, that's a record that I really like. And that's from a few years before when she was about his age on this record. Of course, the great Ron Carter's on there. Roberta's piano playing is featured. It was a huge hit as well, especially when the Clint Eastwood movie came out. Um, but this was sort of the beginning of her really, you know, starting to, I guess she really crossed over a few years later um, in terms of radio and stuff. It was kind of a weird time when, when the music was still being segregated in some whack ways. Uh, but like you say, 72, just an incredible year. And you you know, you can kind of hear in the music in terms of the creativity that was making it onto the pop charts. You know, that didn't first happen in 72, but I mean, this was just like, uh, it, it was like a, a snowball coming down the mountain. It was like an av avalanche of, of hipness. And I think that this record, although it's not the most famous record uh, from that year, it, it did sell over a million copies, which is huge. Um, but it's just not one that's, it's celebrated on the inside, but it's I not mean, celebrated on the outside. The a fact lot. that this talking book, Can't Buy a Thrill, Let's Stay Together, all came out in the same year. It's, it's really unbelievable. Yeah. And like the kind of creative music that was being released into the into the popular genres. Yeah. It's amazing. And we're going to talk about as we go, kind of, you know, of course, the, uh, the, the huge imprint of Atlantic Records on a lot of these great yeah. records, Aretha Franklin. Um, and, you know, Arif Martin and Jill Dorn and that whole game, Wexler, of course. Um, but why don't we get into listening to some of this Well, record? hold on. Let's let's talk about okay. a little bit of the band who's playing here. So it's oh, yeah. Roberta Flack and Donnie Hathaway. They're both playing keys and singing. Yes. So there will be some tracks where she's playing Rhodes and he's playing piano and vice versa. Yeah. And they're both singing both and tracks. I, I don't want to say they're interchangeable, but there's times, like, I know both they're playing pretty well. And I was looking at different, like, citations on as to who's playing. I think some of these aren't right. So we're going to talk. We may be wrong when we talk about who's playing. I'm just kind of going by instinct 
in terms of who's playing acoustic piano, who's playing electric, because sometimes there, there's both. And Roberta's playing some organ on here, and I believe Donnie ha has as, it does as well. So our apologies in advance if we screw up any of these. I mean, obviously, the most famous track on here uh, in a lot of ways for the piano playing is Roberta, which is for all we know, and Donnie's singing on that. So that, that one we do know for sure. Um, but yeah, Eric Garrel on guitar, who of course went on to have a fantastic career as a session player. And yeah, CTI. well, and David Spinoza too, incredible session player with yep. people like John Lennon, Paul McCartney. Chuck Rainey is oh. one of the great <laughs> bass players of his yeah. generation. Bernard P Purdy on drums. Pretty Purdy, pretty Purdy. Never heard of him. <laughs> uh, Billy Cobham on drums. He's on one track. On one track. Yeah. Uh, Ralph McDonald on percussion. Jack Jennings and Joe Gentle on flute. Hubert Laws. It was a great, great, on flute. little stunning moment that we're going to highlight, I think. Joe Farrell on soprano sax yeah. and uh, Arif Martin on uh, the string arrangements on a couple of those tracks. Produced by Joel Dorn uh, and Arif Martin, producer and mixing. Yeah. So, and it was recorded uh, from March through October of 1971 in a bunch of different spots. Yeah. Uh, Crystal Industries, Hit Factory, List Studio, Power Station, RCA, Regent Sound, Atlantic. Yeah, they were doing this all over the place. Yeah. Cool. Should we get into listening to... Yeah. Well, okay, you know how we like to do it here at the You'll Hear It podcast? We like to listen to the first track because that's the way oh. the album was presented. And this album is very unique, the way it starts, Agreed. I think. Agreed. It's very... Confident. Um, very confident. Yeah. Um, it's almost like... It's not really aggressive... But it's with its confidence, it's almost passive aggressive with the level of confidence that it has. I think it's great. Yeah. It's sort of stunning in a way. It's it's jarring. It's jarring in a great way. And it it really draws you in. I think there's some incredible stuff going on. So let's take a, a listen to I Who Have Nothing. Great start. Mm. What a great that's a statement. phrase. That's, that's a musical statement. He buys your diamonds. Right. Sparkling diamonds. Check Randy up to the third. Detail. Uh oh. Try to sub. Is that legal? Try to sub. Is that legal on a platinum album? <laughs> Oh, 
Come on. That's that's Roberta. Oh no, that's Donnie on piano. Roberta's on rolls. This whole band too. Chuck Rainey, Donnie on the piano. Yeah. Wrapped in the arms of someone else. When And you know what's amazing about this track? I think the most special part about it, starting off the album, is that oh, obviously that it, bass drum. <laughs> Sorry. it captures a, a musical tone, yeah. which is this very down tempo slowness. But the theme of the song, yeah. which is very devotional, I have nothing but love right. to offer. Something that someone with a lot of money and diamonds doesn't have for you it really sets the tone of the lyrics of the album you got you've got a friend you got baby i love you you've got uh for all we know where is the love all of the themes of the record yeah. are are this very humble love yeah this is not like a brash cock of the walk kind of record like this is where not is like, the love <laughs> this is a this is a very like humble introspective I'm devoted to love. I'm devoted to you kind of album. And I yeah. think that track is such a special choice because they set the mood lyrically more. I mean, obviously musically, it's everything is so top shelf. Yeah. But lyrically, I love that choice because it sets the tone, the emotional tone of the album. Yes. You know, when we listen to these songs um, from here on out, you're going to hear this theme of devotion of like, you know, I'm not here to be a winner i'm here to love you know mm. this is kind of like the theme i get from this which is an incredibly beautiful sentiment uh and so i love that for the opening track and yeah and there's some really cool things happening musically too yeah and maybe we'll grab just a couple of those but i totally agree and, and i mean the fact that they're able to craft this record there's a lot of like back and forth yin and yang in terms of like the mood this is starting with a lot of gravitas this is start i mean musically and then lyrically they're taking like i don't think this is the strongest lyrics on this album by far but the way that they phrase it and, and combine it with the vibe they make good. it into something amazing yeah. you know um but no i think it's fantastic but it's like the angle that they took for this song is kind of weird, you know, but it's so great. I mean, the 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 what, what they were able to bring out of it, and I think because of that really strong musical statement that they make, which is pretty. I mean, I don't know how many seconds is before they start singing, but it's a while. Let's just check out the beginning. And this out of time G minor, and this was a, an Italian pop song. Yeah, and Ben E King had a hit with new English lyrics back in the yeah, 61 some, they, or it was like a big hit, and you know, Italy's always had big pop hits. Everybody likes to sing well, there. This is what's so great about it is it feels very Italian in sentiment. You know what I mean? It right. feels very dramatic, very and the melodies dramatic. are yes. soaring in this like kind of like operatic right. way. Okay. But I think I think like Roberta and Donnie personalized it in a way. Now, of course, we have the 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 context of history and knowing like their musical relationship and then, you know, the agony of Donnie's life and like yeah. how Roberta, you know, helped. And like all the, the the tragedy of it. So maybe I'm putting too much on it, but I feel like they personalize it in a way. And a couple of these other tunes too, they really capture the time, the political strife with race, race relations in the U.S. during this time, yeah, sure. black power movement, all these different things. Like that was all very uh, present. I mean, Be be Real Black for me, which we're going to listen to too, Incredible. is one of the most amazing stunning, statements on this stunning record. Stunning track. Um, but I think this starting out in this way with a cover to be able to craft that this is normally something you have to create yourself to try to get to this kind of vibe. Yeah. And I think the music is what does that. And then they were able to personalize the lyrics in a way. And then they're immediately on the blues, right? Can we give a shout out too to the country of Italy for the great melodies over the years? Yeah, man. They're good at melody over Four. there. And four minor, just very simple stuff, but kind of weird, you know. Oh. 
And Purdy, like, I mean, the heart, like, I mean, obviously, Bernard There's Purdy so is much the to mess up this in this when, when a track is like this. Oh, and you're at the beginning. They probably didn't know it was the beginning of the album. But I mean, like, Purdy's groove when he comes in is like, yeah. it's kind of a scary instant. It's just like, you're not alive. And like, they put those those things on you. Boom. And then you, it's, but you, you talk about an irregular heartbeat. This is a regular heartbeat. <laughs> Uh. Donnie's piano playing uh. throughout the whole album, this track too. And he's not like, it's very. No, man, Bernard oh, Purdy, that king of drum. dynamics. Boom, boom. And I mean, look, this. I love, by the way, this year, you know, we talked about all those great records. I don't know if it's because those all the great music that was made this year yeah. or vice versa, but production during this time, the early 70s, my favorite era. Apex Mountain for, for production. Apex Mountain and, for production. And, and, and is it perfect clarity and all that? No. But is it vibe-wise? Is it just the right? I mean, it's raining outside. I could oh like I could just listen to Bernard per, uh, Bernard Purdy play that kick drum for like 15 minutes straight. Yeah. I mean, is it the cleanest recorded ever? Uh, maybe, in a way. <laughs> like, it's, I mean, it's the most human and clarity of humanity coming through a bass but drum. But there's this like intersection of this of the things that the technology was putting on the music. Yes. And the and the the analog clarity of the day that yeah. I think is unsurpassed. Yeah. And I mean, I think that what you hear with the way that Donnie and Roberta are phrasing some of those lines, like, this is not just, oh, they just got together and did this in one take. That, you can tell, like, they really did some work, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't like pitch control and, like, like you can hear the breaths and, like, you hear the humanity, like, they are listening to each other I and think, they're matching the vibrato. And what's crazy oh. is they're way, they have way different voices. They're yeah. way different kinds of singers. Which gives you that beauty of that duo, like, you know? Like, Donnie Hathaway, no joke, and I, this was going to be on one of my uh, one of my hot takes later might be the greatest singer who ever lived. Like just pure singer, just the his voice and his choices and his control and his range. Yeah, and what he can do is, I think, up there with anybody. Yeah, strong, clear control, emotion, telling the song. Yeah, range, all of it. Roberta Flack has a more like. Uh, vulnerable sounding voice. Yeah. She doesn't have, I mean, she's an incredible singer, but she doesn't have that same level of like vocal ability. Yeah. I think that Donnie has, but they are, but she's such an incredible musician. She's yeah. able to match, they're able to match each other so perfectly. And I love her voice. I'm not saying that she's a, oh, like course. not a good singer. I think she's a fantastic singer. I'm just saying he's like, as like a goat, right? Yeah. One of the goats. Yeah. And Anybody's like, going to be like, how do you keep up with that? Yeah, totally. And like, but they blend so seamlessly. It's really incredible. It, I mean, it's a testament to both of their abilities as musicians to be able to do that as well. Totally agree. And I mean, I... Because that's which, a taste thing. That's not a, that's not a technique thing. Right, right. No, I mean, I, you know how much I love Stevie Wonder, but in terms of just vocal abilities, Donnie's a tick above. In yeah. a, how, oh, hot takes. Sorry, we're getting ahead of ourselves with that. I agree with that. I agree Can we with catch that, that one um, tritone sub just because it's fun? Oh, I went right to it. I'm just a so there, it's going back to the G minor, right? And want you so. Oh, so great. One. So great. And it's just so confident the way they go to it, you know? Oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right, I could get stuck on this track all day, but we got other tracks to go to, my friend. I think Chuck Rainey, oh man. Is he? Is the, the, he's definitely underdog, Chuck Rainey. I mean, I know he's been on everything, but oh yeah, no, he's yeah. he's on a lot of stuff. You don't even realize he's he's we on. A lot about, I think he's on. Um, what what was the Steely Dan from seventy two record? The Camp I Throw. I think he might be, he on, might that. be on that. He he's might on be on some that. John Lennon. He's on a lot yeah. of shit. Yeah. Well, look, I'm going to read this here. This is I couldn't find a lot of reviews on, it, but I really like this BBC review, which was actually from many years later. This will give us a little context on the album as we dive into it. One of the best duet albums of all time, Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway, was made at the request of Atlantic producer Jerry Wexler. Flack and Hathaway had been friends at Howard University. I don't think that's true. I think that was kind of a legend because I don't think they were there at the same time. Anyway, and Hathaway had played piano on Flack's early albums. It was Wexler's suggestion that the two uh, initially record Carol King's You've Got a Friend. They took the song out of middle-class bohemian bed sits and relocated it to the inner city. Okay, this is some, I don't know about, this might be some UK opinion of what's happening, but possibly. 
Released simultaneously with James Taylor's version, the two covers vied for U.S. chart so space. So crazy, man. Flack and Hathaway's reading is so heartfelt and emotional, it's probably the best cover of, of King's original. The song that really cemented the popularity of Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway was Where Is The Love, a molasses sweet pop song. It was written by Ralph McDonald and William Salter and originally intended for the vo vocal group Fifth Dimension. It sounds as sweet, breezy, and, and peachy as any of Stevie Wonder's high period ballads, that's weird, and remained on the U.S. charts for the best part of a year. It also made the U.K. top 30 in 1972. People who bought the album on the strength of that hit were surprised to find a work of great depth and tenderness. A cover of You Lost That Loving Feeling detunes the drama of Phil Spector's Righteous Brothers original, we're going to get into that, yeah. and makes it an anguished urban whisper. Uh, between lovers, really uh, leaning into the urban angle. Be Real Black for me was a perfect anthem for the Black is Beautiful movement, a celebration of African-Americanism. As it progresses, the album becomes ever more solemn and somber, um, blah, blah, blah. We'll link to this review. I think it's actually pretty good. A little little bit of weird stuff, but um, some good stuff happening in there. So that was kind of, you know, you know what's some, some reaction, some critical reaction to it. Um, but I thought we could go into well, let's go some into bangers, some, some right? bangers here. Yeah. So I want to play my banger. Here. Okay, and I just said Chuck Rainey. It was Steely Dan. It was on. Uh, I was confused about that, but yeah, not not John Lennon, Steely Dan. Okay, that he did most of. It. But there was a story. There was I I I, I need I need to confirm it before I say it on the podcast. Ooh, but I think stay there's, tuned. There's pod, a pod, Pottles Pottles verse. So my my pick for a banger yes. is you've got a friend. It's oh. the second track. Okay. Uh, it is the James Taylor uh, song, You've Got a Friend. And this version is one of my favorite songs of all time. Yep. It's good road sound right there. Roberta's choices are so interesting, but this, this line here... Yep. It's so much fun when mm. you play it right. <laughs> is that it? Yeah. I've struggled with that over the years. Well, it's hard to hear, and there's some interesting things happening You've got here. it. So we've got a D. It's in the key. We're in the key of... Um, a flat. Of A flat. And so it starts with this D flat over F, right? And then this G flat, sort of major seven. So the middle notes stay the same. you got A flats. Yep. A flat, D flat, F, A flat. Middle notes stay the same. Go up to B flat. Yep. Bass moves to G flat, and then we got this F minor over G. Oh, yeah. At C F A flat C over the G, and then the second time she just plays a tr uh, the octave of C's. Yeah. Mm. There's so much little crunchy things happening. That G is real short, and then this two five. And what and is then, Roberta singing? And over so that, Donnie's so playing this like. This kind of voicing, B flat F with a C on top. Yeah. And she does an A natural. Ooh, I love it. Let's listen to that. Oh, it's so <laughs> That's great. so crazy. But this is such a banger. This is the second track on the album. Yeah. And again, that feeling of humble love here in the in the sense of now we're in this friendship. Yeah. But this is like the, the whole album is like a devotional album. You know what I mean? It's so beautiful, the sentiment. And then... I think this is one of the best vocal performances of all time. And soon I, will I mean, be there dude. To up. Come on. Even your darkest night. That's Donnie on Rose. It's Donnie on Rose, yeah. yeah. Just call out my name, and you know I am. Chuck Rainey. I'll come Busy as a bee. Busy in all the right ways. Oh, Is he going to get the... <laughs> he might get the soul, the John Coltrane solo award, too. <laughs> Very sparse array. It's that hot fall. All you have to do is call, and I'll be there. The Carol 
can't write a banger on this one? So all you gotta do is, all you gotta do is call Little plagal thing happening. Yeah. There. And then back to that. Woo! And it good to Stop know that you got a friend. These are, okay, things James Taylor People couldn't do. Right. So but these little cold. harmonic alterations happen on like three different tunes in the same way with that fourth movement. Which kind of pulls the album together with all the covers. Can you imagine you're James Taylor, you release your version, and then at the same time they release this version, you must be like... They both had an audience. Well, the James Taylor version was a huge... He's not crying. He's making a lot of money. Well, and I mean, Carole King's Tapestry version is yeah. like is a different thing, too. I mean, Carole King wrote in a... I mean, to write a song that becomes obviously a hit, yeah. but like kind of an anthem and just a beloved song from a, a, a bonafide pop hit, but that be, can, can be covered in three different ways at the same time yeah. is kind of like, that doesn't happen anymore. For real. There's harmonizing of the line. And you know where Underrated, major seven to dominant seven. Donnie here. That's a good okay. solo, too. Best part of the album. Oh, yeah. And it's just rolling along. Okay, so that's... This is this is my banger of a solo. It's this one thing. Donnie says, look out, and does this shit on the roads that melts your face. It has no business right. being this, but he... One more time. This is For me, this is the apex mountain of the album. Mm. Oh, nasty. Just this, like, so. Oh. No, one more time. One more time. See you again. You know, Randy kind of leads up to it, though. Yeah. Look out. Hey. When the spring summer right, together, right? Fall. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. All you have to do is call. I can live in this group. Oh, they live there. You got a friend. Oh. Look at that pentatonic. So they do that that think, kind of pen pentatonic harmonization on a, on a couple of tunes on here, which is really, they're so natural and then the phrasing is together and like their ideas of which direction they're going to go is so interesting right? there's some amazing tracks on here obviously be black for me and uh for all we know and where is the love but i gotta say for me you you've got a friend is the banger is yeah the banger i think it's i think it's it might be apex mountain of donny hathaway's vocal performances for me too there's a lot i mean there's so much there's so many good things to choose from but like it, it always is at the top of the mountain for me. It's great. Now I feel a little weird that I chose Where is the Love. No, there's because nothing. <laughs> you can't feel weird about Where is the, the Love, th though. This is also like, in, but there's some cool stuff that happens. This is obviously the, the biggest hit, the most popular. I'm just looking at the Spotify bangers. This is by far, I mean, over 41 million. Oh, yeah. Uh, to the, this is the hit song <laughs> of the record, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's check out a little bit of that. Oh. Okay, can we just talk about how this starts? Chuck Rainey. Uh, Eric Gale, like per, like the rhythm section. This is a very subtle thing the way it starts, but like this is also a little bit of foreshadowing to the way the best. Well, these were some of the best session players of the '70s would play. You talk about Steely Dan and these different records. Um, you know, Michael McDonald. What was it? The uh, what was the band he came up in? The Doobie Brothers. The Doobie Brothers. That's what I was looking for. Free. <laughs> um, like the way. You sure, you were born in 1971. <laughs> I was young. So like, but that the clarity with which they would execute on stuff. Like, check this out. I mean, just... Yeah, newsflash, you get the best studio musicians in the studio. <laughs> and say, play great, and they just yeah. do it. With some really Chuck good Rainey songs. this is like, he's busy as a bee, but in all, all the right ways. Great string arrangement. I think Chuck might be 
vying for the Oscar Peterson overplaying award. Weird fourth movements on a pop hit. I like it. I'm here for it. And like that little part, every time Chuck Randy does this a little bit differently. Like that's the fun thing about listening to this for so many years. Like, like from that A flat up to the B flat. Okay, we're gonna talk about that a little later. I just talk about it now since we're there. I think this is giant steps. Tell me if I'm wrong here. Oh, this is good. Uh, yeah. it, so we got it changes tonal centers by a major third. Yeah. Like if we're they don't keep going though. Yeah, it's 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 a major third apart, just like giant steps. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. yeah. So I was right. You were right. Good. Yeah. But actually giant steps is uh, let's let's not ruin where's episode. the love with giant steps. <laughs> We talked about this on the other tune. Underrated. Major seven on, on uh You've Got a Friend. Major seven to dominant yeah. to the four boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all over this record. That's an underdog for sure. Yeah. Underdog, yeah. Oh, I love this line. I... Was it just a lie? Oh man. Where is the love? See, Chuck Ray a little different this time. If you had had a sudden change of heart, Giant steps. What? <laughs> I gotta tell you about my Eric Gale Giant Steps John Coltrane connection. Oh, Dottie right here. Age of Aquarius time, 1972. Hello. Okay, so that's amazing. We know that. It's a banger. Yeah. It is a banger. What about your banger solo, man? What do you got? Oh, bangers. Okay, so for all we know, which, you know, this is, I think this is a, a fantastic, it's obviously a fantastic version with Donnie singing, Roberta on piano, um, and when Hubert Laws come in, comes in, but I'm going to actually start at the beginning. It's not that far into it, but. For all we know. Mm. Touch. We may never meet again Before you go Is Roberta playing the perfect accompaniment right now? Make this moment sweet again What an incredible voice That's what sets him. Yeah, it's just to be that rich and full, way up there in your little, you know, like that sort of mid voice. Is that Hubert Laws? Hubert Laws. I think that's an alto flute. Amazing. So that's just, a, he plays a little more after this, but like, it's not like Hubert Laws is most amazing playing or whatever, but to come into that sort of an intimate duo yeah. with anything, you know, I just love, I just love, I just want to hear the way he just flies up that little line. It's just so right. The last minute. Little half whole scale Ooh, happening. But it's like, you know, there's a couple on a date at a beautiful Italian restaurant with a little sequester table, and you're going to come over and just, like, how are you going to sit down with them? That's going to be hard. <laughs> but if you got your little flute and your Hubert Laws, there's an elegant way to do it, and I think he nailed it. Uh, let's do some over underdogs. Oh, I love them. Yeah, over underdogs. Overrated. Overrated. Okay, now, I racked my brains on this, uh, and the only thing I came up with is that Bernard Purdy is not overrated. Okay, that's right. under, that means underrated. We're going to do that later. <laughs> Overrated. But, We're gonna. I'm gonna say original chord changes. Our original chord changes overrated because <laughs> listen to. <laughs> I want you to. I want to. We're gonna. Let me take you back here. But that's not on this album. Are there any original chord changes? Well, actually. Oh yeah. But baby, 
Here's the uh, the Righteous Brothers. Yeah. Shout out Righteous Brothers. One. Yeah. Two over one. Yeah. Five. One. This is beautiful, iconic. It's all sitting on the wall. Five minor. Yeah. Which is hip. Now let's listen to uh, Roberta and Donnie. Discipline. Key of G. Three. Three. Yeah. Four. Four and a half diminished. Four and a half. I love it. <laughs> Six major. Dominant. All Two dominant. dominant. Yeah. Chuck Rainey is opening up. Five. And then the one. So good. And they do it again. Yep. A flat major sliding down, <laughs> sliding down approach. It's I don't like, know. If, uh, that's. I mean, that's so far away from the Righteous Brothers, and it works somehow. So. I bet that was Donnie. That was a lot of. Donnie oh yeah. Type of See, stuff. it feels like a lot of yeah. Donnie moves there. So that is, uh, yeah, uh, overrated original chord changes. Also, just this might be controversial. You know, I'm a string arranger. I yeah. love strings. I think the strings were a little overused on this album. Ooh, I think overused or overrated. Overrated in that they were overused. Like interesting. I th I think where they're effective, they're perfect. Yeah. But I think they could have been on maybe three less tracks than they're on. Actually, now that I'm thinking, like, so when they come in on "For All We Know," that that's an overrated. Like, I I, I, I I'm it's hesitant not to say this, but it's true. I'm I, I'm hesitant to say this because I think that track is so great. How can I not say it's perf the perfect greatest version? Yeah. Of "For All We Know," but I feel like. Once, like the string stuff is great at the end, but it wasn't needed. This is what it I'm saying. It wasn't needed. I think it's, sometimes, but it's the way it's done is great. I mean, you've done loads of string arranging too. Sometimes it's like, oh, we've got the strings, let's put them on everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, I think, one of our primary jobs as string arrangers to say, like, actually, strings are not like it's more powerful if they're not on this track or yeah. if they're not in this section and to use them like you would use any other arranging tool. They don't have to play on everything. Yes. They're, and they're very much a sprinkle in a lot of pop music. So there's not, it's not like it has to carry anything. It's a texture that I think can sometimes be overused on this album. Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of like the Hubert Law, like if Hubert Laws had come in and been doing all his stuff and they'd had him in the middle of the mix, it'd be like, why? Like, this is overrated to have. But like, that's hard to come into that tune that way, but to be additive without getting in the way. And maybe the, maybe the string. And I love, I got a Pops orchestra here. For right. Crying no, 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 but it's yeah. great. Uh, underrated. Okay, so underrated. Country music, R&B fusion. Okay. I've always thought this, correct me if I'm wrong, but that this is country. That sounds like country. The wagon wheel. It's very country. The, uh, what's the stuff? Tumbleweed. I mean, that's a killer groove. It sounds like Beyonce. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> Really? But just fusion music that's hip, right? Chuck Randy can play anything, so it's like... I'll tell you what, what's, what's underrated is the fast two-beat feel. We don't yeah. get that in pop music anymore. That, that's right. Mm, but is that a, maybe it's not a country group? But it sounds kind of country. That's it's definitely yeah. a country group. Yeah. Uh, okay. What else is underrated? Well, can I uh, get? Can I do one here? Yeah, please. I'm gonna weirdly say Donny Hathaway in general is underrated. Not by us. Not Sorry. by us. But not I, today. I think he is by by mainstream America. By a country mile. He's <laughs> he is an underrated yes. artist. I think he's like up there with some of the greatest American musicians who's yep. ever lived. And I don't think he gets as many flowers as he deserves. Agree. I, I mean, think he's more influential than people give him credit for, too. I think a lot of vocalists steal his shit. Oh, and absolutely. Like, I think he's got a lot of lot, lot of things to claim from from uh, modern music. The connection from Donny Hathaway to Luther Vandross is a direct line. Yeah. Like, there's that's absolutely. And really, even on Stevie, I mean, I know Stevie influenced, there was influence back and forth, but I think because Donny Hathaway didn't have a huge output, that's the only thing that's kept him from being, yeah. you know, really, really widely known. I mean, everybody who's heard and knows his music and and 
of course, his biggest hit was with Roberta Flack, but years later, right before he passed. You know? I, I think also Roberta Flack's piano playing is underrated. I think she's Absol I, genius. I've been saying that for years. Yeah, I, she's incredible. To totally agree. The only other thing underrated, more of an unknown, is John Coltrane's influence on that album. I know uh, that we did. did we that. Are, are you bringing Giant Steps back into well, the picture Well, not Giant here? Steps, <laughs> but Eric Gale, the fantastic guitarist on here, on here. Um, on here. Shout out on here. Plug on country. <laughs> Eric Gale on here. Uh, up on here. Um, out of Brooklyn, bed -Stuy, shout out bed -Stuy neighborhood. That is not um, country. <laughs> that is not, that's the opposite of country. As the BBC would say, that's urban. Um, but he, when he was coming up in high school, used to go to John Coltrane's home for oh. after school snacks from John Coltrane's wife. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. Eric Gale used to hang with Coltrane? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Dang. Yeah. So that's a little, that's another, cool. another influence on this. Uh, um, okay, so how about some Apex Mountains, Peter? Well, man, I feel like we've been Apex Mountaining, but I'm glad to jump in. For, okay, so what we just listened to with For All We Know, is this the greatest version of that song? I, I think so. Yeah, this is the Apex Mountain for For so. All We Know, for sure. I mean, I remember hearing Shirley Horn do this live. I don't know if she recorded it. And that was, it's always different though. Like a memory of a live performance in a way can be a higher Apex than anything on record. But then anything that you love on record, you have the benefit uh, of listening to it over and living with it through different parts of your life. Yeah. Through, through, you know, like the music stays the same, but your attenuation to it increases your, your cultural and spiritual awareness of just the world and yourself and everything. So, I mean, beyond just this version holds up, it's beyond that. I mean, this is one of the greatest standards, I think, ballads written. I mean, it's a beautiful composition Gorgeous. and there's beautiful versions, but I, I don't think it gets any better than this. Is this the apex mountain for covert <laughs> giant steps changes? I am going to say no. Oh. Because this is, we're talking about changes. It's only three of them, too. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't go all the way through. Like, I would say, like, Have You Met Miss Jones is more because it actually goes through all three keys that Giant Steps goes through. And it was before Giant Steps. So let's talk about that in another episode because I never knew that. So there you go. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, okay. But this. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. What, okay. I've got. Now this is gonna. This is <laughs> gonna move panic in Peter's eyes. This, no, I'm. I'm excited. I'm like you know mental note. Ask okay, him about okay, that. Okay. okay. This will be. This might get into hot takes and some controversies. You've got a friend, the beloved song. We talked about. You already know how I feel about this. Yeah. Is this the apex mountain for that song? Yes. Okay. Well, then that's that's easy because I agree. The, I, yes. I don't think this is. We could say is this apex mountain for Carol King's writing for other people. I don't think that's the case. I think Aretha Franklin. Is yeah. More incredible versions of Carol King songs, but I think, Ooh. well, That's just because she did. He's going, you go right into the hot takes. No, I mean, natural, Aretha's version of natural woman is incredible. It's, that's an amazing, that, there's no better fit of a vocalist with yeah. a song. Right, 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 right. I think you've got a friend is this is definitely the best version. I think it's one of my favorite tracks of all time, but yeah. Best version of this. Yeah. I think no question. Okay. So I've got one for you. Yeah. Best use of the extended Mixolydian Best extended use of the Mixolydian scale in an R&B song in kind of a weird way. Yeah. Let's check this. We listen to this. This is the You've Lost That Love and Feeling, yeah. G Mixolydian scale. They they stay on it. Bolivia? <laughs> I said R&B song. Okay. But nice. listen to that. Little sitar. Is that Eric Gale on this? Is this sitar? the Apex Mountain for a sitar in a pop song? Probably not. No. Probably not. You know when Roberta comes in. No alterations. When I... They're sitting on that G, and there's no. Oof. And even when she slides up, she's sliding up in all Mixolydian. This is a kind of a weird song. But they make it nice. Anyway, yeah, extended Mixolydian. Is this the apex mountain for duo vocals? Ooh. Is this when they peaked? I'm going to say no, only because the late 70s, early 80s, you got Kenny and Dolly, you got Martin, Martin, you got Marvin and <laughs> you got Tammy. Martin and Short. <laughs> you got Martin and Short. You got Marvin and Tammy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Chris Christopherson and Barbara Streisand. You got a lot of great duo right. tracks, singles coming out right. in that time. This is, but uh, Taylor Swift and Drake. No, that's later. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's a lot of. These are great, though. These, uh, this is. But it's not the Apex. This is maybe my favorite of all of those, but I think Apex Mountain, as far as like when did that Ooh, peak, I yeah. think it was right right around early 80s, probably. And maybe Tammy Terrell, Marvin Gaye, that's before this, though. Is that's, it? That's oh, great it is too. before this. Yeah. That's, that might be Apex Mountain for duo vocals. Well, didn't Marvin do some uh, duos too in the late 70s? Um, yeah. Oh, he did a bunch of great ones. Um, okay. What about. I got one for you. 
Apex Mountain for Covert. This might be the Apex. If Martin, because Marvin and Tammy were right around this time. That was no, it was earlier. Mm. It was earlier, my friend. I'm, I'm putting a stake down in the in the muddy waters of Midtown, saying, "Wow, it's raining hard out there." Good. Okay. Um, it, I think we have an Apex Mountain for Covert use at the beginning of an R and B or whatever Black American music, whatever style we're going to call this. Very covert use of seven. We know Donnie loves seven. Oh, good. Check this out. Two, three. This is Be Real Black for me. Four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you know what? why this is so effective? For any budding songwriters and composers yeah. out there, the reason why this works... What is it? The... D7. It's yep. because it's all based around the phrase, right? Yep. This phrase. One, two, three. Like it works with the melody perfectly. It's not, they're not cramming some kind of like weird time signature in for its own sake. Right. It's because it's the right time signature for this particular phrase. But it could have been one, two, let's see. One, will you count for me, sir? One, two, three. It could have been. I'll do it the right way. But just like his <laughs> da 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 ba do 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 There's something about lopping off that beat that feels right feels with so the phrase. Right. You have that. You have a, a pause at the end of the phrase, right? There's an extension of da da. Yep. And that extra beat is maybe just a little too long yes. for Donnie. Like, and you're yep. th he's throwing you off. It just fits musically with the phrase, I think, perfectly. Good, good, good. Uh, is this Peter's, uh, we did Apex <laughs> Mountains. What about Genesis? Is this the Genesis well, the of only the thing Quiet I could think Storm? Of, yeah, exactly. Kind we of, got a Quiet Storm going on out here. I know. I mean, this is years before officially that was titled. And of course, Quiet Storm is... Um, it's a radio format. Yeah, and wasn't that uh, Smokey Robinson? He actually had a song or an, al oh, an called album called Quiet Storm. Yeah, that's what it Storm. was officially. But I mean, this do is the do? beginning. I don't listen to the radio. No, it's anymore. gone. It's been gone that Man, format. Magic 108 yeah. had the greatest Quiet Storm yeah, yeah. back in the day. Yeah. I have a little family connection with the creation of the term and the actual. We'll talk about that another day. What are you talking about? I got some in-laws that are actually very involved with, with 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, we got 10 minutes to wrap this up, my friend. Um Anyway, yeah, I think this is the beginning of that. Like, this would fit in with Quiet Storm. Actually, they used to play this stuff off of here. Yeah, of course. For, for sure, you know. Because that was part of the thing when Quiet, especially like the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. Like, they used to play like Sarah Vaughn on the hip Quiet Storm format radios. I would, like, they throw in, like, it was all about the vibe. I'm sure know? there's plenty of, of Spotify playlists and Quiet, like, oh, yeah. and like satellite radio channels. But what I wouldn't give for a Magic 108 Quiet Storm session. Maybe there's some on YouTube. I can check it out. Apex uh, Mountain for Donnie Hathaway. I think this it, is a hot take too. I think this time, 72, might have been an Apex Mountain for Donnie. So album-wise, I'm going to say no. Okay. I'm going to say Donnie Hathaway Live. I think is just for Donnie. When did that come out? After this? I think No, I think it came out right before this. Right, right around this time. That's what I'm saying. It's like this string. Right, but we're talking about the album. Well, we're talking about the time. Is okay, this, the time, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Maybe, okay. Let's give out some awards. Okay, the Oscar Peterson overplaying award. <laughs> We've talked about him. He's all over the place. He's <laughs> filling in every space he can find. It's the great Chuck Rainey. Chuck and he's Rainey. doing it in such a tasteful way. Oh, it's, so cool. This is perfect because it is named after Oscar Peterson. Who, Same thing. <laughs> on the, on the, here, look, can we just play? I want to play a little bit no, of the- No, we don't have time for that. We do have a little bit of time. <laughs> uh, if we could play a little bit of the Ella and Louie. <laughs> oh, he's all- He's already over. No, this is the intro. He's allowed to overplay. So this is Oscar Peterson playing you piano. You think that's a nice little solo? Well, don't worry. It's not over. I thought I'd found the man of my dreams. <laughs> he just now solos through the whole thing. Yeah. This is how the story ends. But it's good. He's going to turn me down and say, can't we be friends? <laughs> it's just his solo never stops. He's essentially... Instead of just playing chords, through, yeah, he's like, no, he's just gonna solo. He's like, I'm, I'm Oscar M. F. Peterson, and he and it works yeah. somehow. And I think this is appropriate for Chuck because Chuck's kind of doing a little bit of this on the yeah. bass. He's, he's, he's filling a lot of spaces. He's where's the love? It, he's really doing a lot, and it works. It works. That's exactly. the key. John uh, Coltrane Theft Award. Hmm. So. Is it Roberta Flack on piano? Does she steal this on piano? I think so. I think so. Just because she, 
I mean, not for me, because I, I've been talking about it and I love her piano playing, but I think she's a little under the radar for a lot of people. Does she um, steal this record on piano, though? Do we think that's I, the I, case? I, I don't know. Because, I mean, if you were talking about just... Actually, yeah, I would say so. I'm going to... For, like, for what she does on For All We Know, just that alone. That's good. And then there's other little... And, then, you know, Mood, the last tune, which we're going to listen to in just a second here, because that's like... That's a stunning thing, and it's Donnie and Roberta, and it's 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 okay. no vocals. I'll give you that. The Cecil Taylor taking the out award, I'm going to give to Roberta Flack, and I'm going to give it... Uh, <laughs> on the first track... Right around the three minute mark. So this okay. is I Who Have Nothing. Yeah. Listen to that again. And she sits on that, that half step. Yeah. yeah. And she does a bunch of little things vocally throughout yeah. this whole album that earns her the Cecil Taylor taking it out award. Because she's really, she is, it's not just beautiful thirds right. and pentatonic harmonies that she's doing with Donnie. She's doing some, she's going for some really risky stuff and it pays off. It's so good. Uh, any first call subs on this? <laughs> Who are you first <laughs> call subbing? I well, like I, mean, I like James Jamerson on the bass. You put James Jamerson here. Yeah. I think that's that's it'd cool. be different, but it'd be killing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think when you talk about Roberta and Donnie, that gets a little stickier. I mean, Stevie Wonder, could he have done this with with, with Roberta? Yes. Hear me out. Okay. Stevie and Joni. Ooh. What if it was a Stevie and Joni? No, I'm not. Okay, well, it wouldn't be as different. good. Yeah. It wouldn't be. I'm, I was thinking more like if you had, okay, so if Donnie's there, but Roberta's not like Aretha Franklin, that'd be different. It'd be so different. But, but see, but like, that's what I'm saying. Is like the, the nice is the nice part is the mix between Donnie's incredible vocal abilities and Roberta's like, you know, vulnerable, like expressive vocal yeah, quality. Yeah. And I think Donnie and Aretha, it's kind of too much of like the same power. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't actually I don't think you could sub either one of those. Yeah, but James Jamerson could work. There's other drummers. I would like to hear Ron Carter on this. I'm just saying. Ron I mean, Carter's on he could lay some stuff down, of course. Yeah, for sure. Of course. Uh bespoke genre. What do you got? Um, so I came up with uh Quiet Storm Aquarius. Nice. Because, you know, it is uh moving towards the quiet storm. You know, it's if it's not the Genesis, it's certainly a big influence on that, on that genre. And uh, grown folks music and all that kind of stuff, but I got R and Breathe. This the sir the the sitar. That's the Aquarius Age of Aquarius kind of thing. Sorry, R and Breathe. R and Breathe. I like it. It just feels right. R and Breathe. There's a lot of there's a lot of space in this. There's a lot of room to breathe. So R and Breathe. Did we hit our hot takes and rants? Not enough? yet. Uh, Okuchamans. The album cover is good. It's good. Can you put it back up there, Caleb, real quick? It's good. It's not great. It's good. Yeah. It's fine. I like the image, the sort of Rorschach image in the middle. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful, it's but a it's, off, it's not, off it's better. not very memorable. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. So good. There's that. Um, that was our most awkward segment ever. Uh, hot takes and rants. Um, okay. My hot take on this. Yeah. The intersection of classical jazz and gospel is some seriously fertile ground. For pianists in particular. That's a Roberta, real hot take, Peter. <laughs> Roberta and Donnie, like that's the you main- You mean all the genres that piano sounds good on? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but I'm saying like they're, Roberta and Donnie both have those influences. I'm not going to say in equal amounts, but in deep amounts. They're not like, Roberta's like, oh, I dabbled in it. I mean, she came up in the church. Yeah. But they both had classical training. They both had, a, I don't know how much, uh, I know they both had jazz, you know, uh, Try, you know, were around jazz influences for sure. But I mean, those three things and other ones too, of course they had other influences, but when you get those in sort of like deep amounts, I wouldn't say equal, but deep amounts, good things happen. Hot take. My hot take. We need more duo records. I'm talking <laughs> more Marvin and Tammy. I'm talking more Donnie yeah. and Roberta. Yeah. I want some more Aaron Neville and Linda Ronstadt. Oh, I want some more Kenny and Dolly. I want it all. Yeah, I want yeah. it all. I want some more Tom Petty and Stevie Nicks. I want all of that. We're here for it. Um, Jonathan Batiste and somebody those that could be a good um place we could go. Little little J Bat and Yeba maybe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Something like go. that. Um. Oh, the snobometer. 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 Uh, what are we talking here? This I I would put. Oh, we're going from one to ten, right? Ten is yeah, just. We're just saying like. Oh, we're just saying. Is it more on the snobometer? I think this is a very snobby record. Not for jazz snobs, but yeah. for music snobs. I agree. Uh, but this is one of the one. This is kind of this record's really in the. You'll hear it, the new wheelhouse of you'll hear. It, I agree. Say. Records that you buy. Oh, I had a great quote here. I'll just say from somebody. This is on the the on YouTube the version the official version of this album. The top YouTube comment. 
YouTube comments, they can either be great or they can be horrible. This one's great. Bought this album when I was in high school, wore it out. 50 years later, I'm still listening. No one since then has come close to the greatness of Hathaway and Black. So her hyperbole, but that's okay. You know, um, greatness being acknowledged, but I love that like wore it out, still listening. I think this is for music snobs more than it is for a general population, only because like a lot of albums in 1972, actually, it's not super shiny. You right. know what I mean? It's not polished. Like right. we listened to the Roy Hargrove album last week yep. with this beautiful polished sound, Yep. you know? And this doesn't have that. This right. is, there's a lot of space. There's a lot of, we just heard Roberta doing some of those some like- Weird stuff. Weird stuff oh, going so on. Those weird changes on, you've got- So we're going to say snobometer is going- Yeah, yeah. It's, it's more towards the snob angle. Okay. Is it better than Kind of Blue? I'd say equal. I'm going to say no, it's not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm right. gonna say equal. This is this is the kind of blue of early seventies R and B records. I think I like kind of blue better than this album, but I do love this. That's album. okay. Yeah. Um, why don't we play ourselves out with the final track, which is really a departure from everything? It's you, some people may have never made it here, so this will be fun. Okay. This is mood, which I believe it's was a written track. by Donnie and Roberta. I might be wrong on that. I should have known that, but thank you, Adam. This was awesome, man. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, bro. So um, until next time, you'll hear it.